Welcome to Wednesday's Church and let's start our service with a prayer. Let's pray. Loving God, we come this morning acknowledging your greatness. You are the creator and the sustainer of all that is around us. And Lord, as we face this world in an atmosphere of oppressive pessimism, we, we thank you that you have given us hope, and you have given us joy, and you have given us your word that we might be a light in the gloom. Lord, use us in any way you need to use us. And we pray too that as we come to worship you this morning, that we might be enriched, that we might leave this service a little bit better, more equipped than when we came. So Lord, bless this time, bless the message that Johnson is to bring us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to read to you from Romans, Chapter 7, verse 15 onwards. I do not understand what I do. For I, what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate to do. And if I do what I want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who did do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do not do what I want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am! Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself in my mind am a slave to God's law, but in sinful life, nature I am a slave to the law of sin. May God help us to understand that reading from his holy word. Let's pray. Loving God, we relate so well to those words. There are things we want to do that we don't do. And we come with good intentions, and yet all the time we seem to fall short of those good intentions. And it makes our travel frustrating and difficult. And so, Lord, we ask that you would bring us not trusting in our strength, but trusting in your strength through the cross, which has brought us salvation and freedom from the law of sin and death. Lord, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your constant encouragement. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit, our companion and our leader in truth. Thank you, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I'll pass over to Johnson, who will bring you the message. Good morning, church. Today is uh, Wednesday, midweek service. I do welcome you wherever you are. And um, let us pray. We are here today, Lord, to worship you. As we bow our heads before you. We want to be amazed by your wisdom, all over by your love, and completely lost in you. Lord, open our hearts to receive you in ways beyond whatever we could ever ask or even think of. Father, we thank you. We thank you so much. Dying on the cross for us so that we can be welcome 
Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Um, I again want to thank Russell for reading the Word of God uh, from the book of Romans, chapter 7, uh, verses 15 to 25. Thank you so much, Russell, for the reading of the Word of God. My theme today is, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Do you ever wonder why people do some of the crazy things they do? People are amazing. Why did she or he do that? Do you sometimes ask that question? Why do people do the things they do? Here's a better question. Have you ever asked why you do some of the things you do? Why do you do some of the things you do? Why did I eat that last piece of cake? Why did, didn't I look where I was going? Why didn't I let him get away with, that, with insulting me? Why did I blow out at my son like that? Why did I put off finishing that project until the very last minute? Why did I wait so long to sell the stock? Why can't I be positive and cheerful all the time? Why do I let these things get me down? Why did I do that? I'm describing anyone. I hope I'm describing someone, anyone who is listening right now. I mean besides me. I mean in my house. I mean around my area. Someone who is listening right now. Why are there so many self-help books on the market today? It's because most of us can help just about anybody except ourselves. St. Paul was like that. Paul was arguably the second most influential person who has ever lived. While it is true that more than a billion people on this earth follow Jesus, much of what we believe about Jesus, we believe because of Paul. He helped to define what the coming of Christ into the world really meant. St. Paul was a man of intellect and insight. He was impassioned and inspired, disciplined and devoted, sensitive and sincere. And yet, for all that, St. Paul could write, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want to, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Sounds like he belongs to our church. It sounds like he belongs to our generation, doesn't he? He is one of our own. Paul says that the law was good. It accomplished what it was designed to accomplish. It revealed sin. Through the law, Paul understood himself. He saw himself as the sinner he really was. In fact, in verse 14, he told the Romans that his flesh was sold over to sin. In other words, his flesh was controlled by sin. So the apostle Paul was like the rest of us. His intentions were the best in the world. His actions, though, did not measure up. Why was he like that? Why are you and I like that? Paul says it is the law of sin at work in our lives. Paul doesn't blame his parents for his flaws. It wasn't his hereditary or his environment or the government or his fourth grade teacher. It has nothing to do with those people. It is hard to imagine the great apostle wrestling with the fleshly sin, but he is very honest with us here. He tells us that he did not do the things he wanted to do and found himself doing the things he did not want to do. St. Paul doesn't blame anyone else for his problems. He says that the problem is in his own mind and heart. He is under what he calls the law of sin. He says there is a war going within his own mind. Something going within his own mind. Have you ever been at war with yourself? It's a miserable feeling. To know that you are a sinner and to feel absolutely helpless to do anything about it, that is an awful way to be. For Paul, there seemed to be two conflicting things happening in his life. He had a desire to do the right thing, but found himself doing the opposite thing. There were two natures at war in him, himself. The flesh was incapable of pleasing God, but the spirit, on the other hand, delighted in God and sought to honor God in everything. Who among us has not found himself in the same struggle with Paul? We speak those things we know as we should not speak. 
We react to displeasing situations in ways that are not appropriate. We know that these things are wrought, wrong, but find ourselves doing them anyway. At the same time, this is a part of us that has sin and desire to please God. First, he recognized the two natures that battled within him. If we want to experience victory in our spiritual hope, we too will have to be able to distinguish the lust of the flesh from the leading of the spirit. I have heard believers justify their sinful actions on the basis that it felt good or it seemed natural to their flesh. Paul is telling us here that the flesh and the spirit are at war with us, within us. If we are to follow Christ and walk in victory, we need to distinguish what is from the flesh and what is from the spirit. Second, notice in verse 18 that Paul told the Romans that there was nothing good in his sinful nature. In saying this, Paul shows us that he thinks of the flesh in nature. More than this, however, he is renouncing that sinful nature as evil. If we are going to walk in victory, we too need to recognize this nature as evil. We need to change from it and refuse to surrender to its impulses and desires. So there are times we ought to be embarrassed. If we are under the law of sin and we cannot remedy it, we ought to be uncomfortable. The discomfort we feel is similar to the pain someone feels when they put their hand on a hot stove. Pain is this nature way of telling us that something is wrong. If you have a problem with some behavior in your life, or you seem powerless to do anything about it, you don't need an attitude adjustment, you need a savior. If we are going to walk in victory, we too need to recognize this nature as evil. We need to turn from it and refuse to surrender to its impulses and desires. Notice also in verse 20 that Paul makes a clear distinction between his fleshly nature and the new person he was in Christ. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it's no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it in Romans 7 verse 20. Paul saw himself as a new person with a new allegiance. He no longer lived as a slave to the impulses and desires of sinful nature. He identified now with what Christ was doing in him by the power of the Holy Spirit. His true identity was no longer with the old sinful nature, but with the person of Christ and what he was doing in his life. Paul's old nature was still alive, but he was no longer subject to it. Now that the Lord Jesus had given and changed him, he identified this new nature and chose to walk in it. Paul doesn't want somebody to help him feel better about himself. He wants to be a new person, a person liberated from the law of sin, a person saved from the law of sin, a person delivered from the bondage of sin. Listen to St. Paul's agony. He writes, For I delight in the law of God in my innermost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched men that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Verses 23 and 24. In verse 24, we see that Paul often felt overwhelmed by this battle within. He cries, who will rescue me from this body of death? His heart longed for victory. He wanted to see the flesh perish. He wanted to see the victory of the Lord over this sinful impulse. But how was this victory possible? How is it going to happen? Because he's now talking about the two members, two natures fighting within himself. And he wants to, those things to be, get rid of. Paul answers this question by reminding us that this hope was in the Lord Jesus Christ. He says the Lord who gave, forgave him and put his life in him was able to give him victory over the sinful nature. So the only way for you to move away from the sinful nature is to accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior. There came a day when there was a victory, but Paul did not win it. Christ did. Paul learned that it was a matter of yielding, presenting himself and letting the Spirit of God live the Christian life through him. I thank God who gives deliverance through Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the answer. God has provided deliverance. It introduced chapter 8 in which the deliverance is given in detail. Both salvation and sanctification come through Christ. He has provided everything we need. We don't look it for anywhere. He has provided us. As we examine our lives, 
We must look not only at our mistakes, but also at the times when we had an opportunity to do right and didn't do it. Most of the time, we are given that opportunity to do the right thing. Confessing these sins of omission, those make us more aware of such opportunities in this future so that we might save God and others more faithfully. George Enos, in his book, A World to Love, tells about a pastor who for years fought what seemed to be a losing battle with a troublesome temper. In spite of his best efforts, he experienced one defeat after another. One day after a violent outburst, he buried his head in his arms in absolute despair as he sat at his desk. Emotionally exhausted, he fell asleep. The pastor dreamed he was in his study, and as he looked out the window, he saw a glorious light. As the light approached him, he realized that it was actually a man who evidently intended to be his guest. The pastor became conscious that his study was untidy and in no condition to receive such a guest. Frantically, the pastor swept and dusted the room, but the more he went, the worse it looked. As he wondered what to do, he heard a knock at the door. I can't let him in while the room is in this condition, the pastor thought of himself. He continued his efforts to improve the appearance of these things, and after a time, the stranger knocked again. What should he do? All his efforts seemingly were in vain. When the stranger knocked at that time, the distraught pastor, who has exhausted all of all his resources, flung open the door saying, I can't do any more. Come in if you enter such a room. As the pastor looked up, he recognized the stranger was Jesus. So the master entered the room, and strangely, and as he did so, the dust seemed to disappear, and everything suddenly became orderly. All was bright and clean and joyful. The master's presence had done in a moment what all his feverish efforts had failed to accomplish for almost 30 minutes. We can't save ourselves from sin, concludes George Knowles, or free ourselves from the habits of sin that hold us in bondage. But we can choose to invite Jesus into our hearts. And when we do, a miracle takes place, a process of change begins that continues as long as we allow him to control our lives. As long as we allow Jesus to control our lives, things will be seen in a different way. People can see the change in your life. You are no longer the one who lives, but Christ now lives in you. Why do? Why did I do that? We sometimes ask. Maybe we, like Paul, are living under the law of sin. If so, we don't simply need more willpower. We need a savior. And we need a savior. Not tomorrow, but today. We need a savior who can help us. That is our Christian work. We trust that the work of Christ is greater than the work we can do. On the cross, he takes away the sin of the world and saves notice that God's forgiveness can cancel every debt and trespass. So I'm just urging you, encouraging you to surrender your life to Christ. When you surrender your all to Christ, he's able to deal with you. I know you. there is war fighting within you, but when you surrender, it is only Jesus who can take control of your life. So surrender your life to him and he'll be able to guide you and help you and calm you. May the good Lord help you as you take this opportunity of receiving Jesus Christ as your personal savior. As you take this opportunity of allowing Jesus to control your life and you are able to say, it's no longer I who lives, but Christ lives in me. May the Lord help you, bless you from now and evermore. Amen. Let us, let us pray as we thank God for what he has done for us. Heavenly Father, we come before you. We thank you for everything that you have done to us. We come here knowing who we are. We pray, Lord Jesus Christ, for those who care for those with serious mental issues, for those who work with patients who are potentially posing a threat to others due to coronavirus, and those who feel bowed down with their responsibilities, who are struggling under the weight of their decisions they have to make. We pray for those with family or friends who are depressed, for all those engulfed by the mental tumor. We pray for all instructed with the gift of teaching and children, for those who struggle to learn and for those who denied an education. We pray for more resources, more opportunities, and more equality among your people. 
Father, we thank you that you are here with us. As we continue to pray for one another, as we continue to share with one another, teach us to love one another. Teach us to be faithful to one another. Father, we thank you. Be with us, Lord Jesus Christ, throughout this week as we continue to dwell upon your word so that you help us to understand your presence. Be with us, Lord. In your name I pray. Amen. Let us receive grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all from now and evermore. Amen. God bless you all. In Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.